Well, uh, if you can, if you have a hard time hearing me, just raise your hand. I've been told that I have a very big mouth, so I'm, I'm not sure if that means that I talk loud or it, what that meant. But I like seeing uh, so many people that have been in some of the programs. And what I want to talk about today is some of the history of the police department, but that history is our commitment to the community. Most of the time when people think of police officers, they think of us uh, or they think of officers that are out working accidents, um, the writing citations, taking reports, working burglaries. Well, we do that at the police department. That is our main job. But there's another part of the police department, and that's the area that I work in, the Special Services Division. We provide programs throughout the community to the schools and to any organization that will invite us out to talk. Well, years ago, when I came to work for the police department, I was really interested in the history. And it's something that I've been trying to put together, uh, trying to interview officers that have left the department, uh, retired, but are still in the community, so that someday, hopefully, when we have a, a larger police department, I'll be able to have a little museum to display a lot of our history items. And I have some boards, and I'll leave them up afterwards, because there's some really interesting pictures of the community. Uh, and one of my favorite is, is the picture that's up here when you come up here. If you look at the uh, street sign, it says Harvey Road and the East Bypass. And if you look behind Lieutenant uh, Onstott, there's nothing but grass. And that's where the bypass is now. About um, six or seven years ago, I asked him to go stand in that same spot so I could take a picture of him, and he wouldn't because he said he'd get ran over. <laughs> but um, in looking at, at the history, I started finding out that the commitment that the police department made to this community started with the police department when it was formed. There's a picture of one of our former uh, police chiefs, uh, Chief Lutke, and he was just an officer then that's actually talking to a group of Boy Scouts. And this picture was taken. Um, back in the uh, late 50s. And that shows a start of being involved in the community with the children. And that commitment is something that we still have. Uh, some of you know, uh, he retired two years ago, but Chief Fellman, um, he grew up in the community, went through the police department, the ranks. He actually started one of the programs uh, a Mrs. Hensley's government class. Any of you go to high school here? Any of you Mrs. Hensley's government class? Well, at that time, it was Captain Fellman went to Mrs. Hensley's government class to talk about uh, how the police department worked and how it functioned within the, the uh, framework of uh, the courts and the government in, in a community. And the kids were real interested in knowing more about the police department and the job. So Captain Fellman said, well, I will take three to four students, and you can come in in the evening when he was off duty. And they actually rode with Captain Fellman, and they shadowed the police officers. So the kids got to hear the call. They got to see from a distance so that they were safe, the officers handling the calls. The department and chief at that time, Captain Fellman, won an award from the Young Lawyers Association, and it essentially started what we call our ride-along program. And that's something that we still have today. Uh, you can contact the police department, and you can come out and ride along with us. Uh, if you go through some of our other programs, it's part of the program that we have. And that commitment to the school is still there. And we've built on it. And how we've built on the commitment to the school was in 1987, a program had been started in California called the D.A.R.E. program. And the College Station Police Department decided that that was something they wanted to offer to the fifth grade students in this community. There was no training in Texas. We actually had to send an officer to California to be trained as our first D.A.R.E. officer. And he still works for the police department. His name is Robert Price, Bob Price. And he grew up here uh, in this community. 
And he's still in the school. Hopefully one day we'll get him out of the school, but <laughs> it's doubtful with him. But he was our first DARE officer. We've been teaching this program for over 25 years, and it's a program that we feel committed to in the department. I know that there's a lot of people who say, well, it doesn't work, or there's no proof that it works. And being a former DARE officer, I, I believe in the program, I believe in all of our programs, or I wouldn't be up here talking about them. And my experience with, with kids, in fact, there's a teacher, one of my former teachers in here that I taught in her class, I've been a police officer, my card's wrong, I've been a police officer for over 27 years. My worst injury that I ever got as a police officer came from a first grader. <laughs> I still suffer from that injury. Um, well, you know, little kids, and that's I, I taught from uh, kindergarten up through fifth grade, and I, I refused to go any higher because that's when they start getting a brain of their own and an attitude. From fifth grade down, they want to hug you and they want to, you know, come up and they love you. And uh, I was in a, the gym talking to kids, and this one little girl just kept scooting up closer to me. And, and as you tell, I don't stand still. And she kept scooting closer, and I'd move and you know, walking around, I was afraid I was going to step on her. Well, she scooted behind me, and I didn't know it, and I went to step back, and when I realized it, I tried not to go on her, and I went head first into a cinder block wall. And so I still, I had got vertigo, and I still have problems with that. So, you know, that's my exciting story as being a police officer, but <laughs> that commitment of being in the schools is very strong. Uh, we now have, we've gone from one DARE officer, I now have uh, supervised the DARE officers, and I have two officers that are committed to the school from fifth grade on down to kindergarten. We uh, teach the DARE class, we teach internet safety to the kids, we teach personal safety, um, anything that the teachers request. And we were always looking for uh, how to make this program better. Well. In about uh, 19, um, the early 1980s, 84, 85, um, Lieutenant Bertie Capella, that's what he retired from the police department as, Lieutenant Capella, but when he came to the police department, he brought with him the crime prevention program. And uh, the program was, you know, all of the, the safety talks and the stuff that we did. And we started the D.A.R.E. program and he said there's got to be another way to really grab the kids attention. So he decided he wanted to get a robot. And um, there's a picture of Freddie on one of these uh, boards up here. But Freddie was our first robot. And when Lieutenant Capella started the program, of course, there was no budget set up in the police department for the programs or to get this equipment. So Lieutenant Capella went to the bank and took out a personal loan to buy this robot. And each month, he went out in the community and to business people and was able to get donations to make the payment for the robot. When I came into the department in the 90s, um, I was able to use Freddie, and I was still part of the, the programs that we used him in the school. We had to retire him, and it really upset me because I really enjoyed taking Freddie because the kids did respond to him. Uh, they talked to him, were able to ask questions, and they listened to him. So we were like several years without a robot. And uh, this past year, we were able to obtain a, a grant, and we got us a new robot. And we take him into the schools. It's a lot different. Uh, and I'd planned on bringing him this morning, but he had to go in for his, uh, you know, 100-mile checkup. <laughs> but he actually has interchangeable characters now. It looks like a little patrol car. It's painted black and white like the ones we drive. We have a, a male cop who's Officer Pat Trollman. We have a female officer who is Officer Safety Sally. And then we just have a, a, a creature um, that's kind of furry looking off of Sesame Street looking. And we were able to use that in the school with the kids. Lieutenant Capella also thought, well, if the, ro if the robot was so good with the kids, then, you know, maybe some puppets would work. So he went and uh, 
got some ladies to help him, and the first puppets we used at the police department were actually homemade hand puppets. And there were a group of ladies in the community that uh, worked with Lieutenant Capella, and they put together the programs, and they would go in and they could talk about personal safety, you know, uh, bicycle safety, and safety around the house using the hand puppets. Well, on the same grant, when we got our new robots, we were able to get new puppets. So if any of you want to be puppeteers, <laughs> I enjoyed send, uh, filling out that uh, training request last year and sending it up to Chief Clancy, three people going to puppet school. <laughs> he said, okay. But we went to learn how to use the puppets and to be puppeteers. And uh, we have the stage. We use that in the community. Well, Lieutenant Capella loved thinking about how we could do more in the community. And a lot of the things that, that we have, maybe other agencies or other places in the community have taken over, uh, the police department, where it is now, is its sixth location. And we've had, always had the little pond. And, and uh, the first, when we were moved to that location at 2611 Texas Avenue, the, the two-story part wasn't on the building. It was just the, the back part. And we still had the pond out there. And Chief Bird was standing there. He had a door to his office, and he was standing in the doorway one day and looking at the pond, and he said, you know, that's just a waste out there. We need to be doing something with it. <laughs> Lieutenant Capella said, okay. So he went to the Lions Club, and um, there's a picture of, of the pond being stocked with catfish. The Noon Lions Club at that time built four piers around the pond that was there. And the police department started hosting kids' fishing days. And that's a big program that the parks department still has today. But the police department started it back in the 80s. He said, OK, well, back to the schools. Looking at the kids that are in the high school, and bringing them safety information. You know, once they get in high school, the puppets and the robots weren't that interesting. They didn't think that those were cool. So Lieutenant Capella and uh, Major Kennedy, and some of them started in looking into and started a program with the junior and senior classes at the high school. And it was called the Breakfast Bash. And they got donations from the community, and it was in hopes of keeping the kids from going out drinking and driving after the prom, giving them something else to do. That's a program that the school still does. The police department's <coughs> involved in it, but we don't actually uh, run it. it was, it's been taken over by the parent teachers associations and stuff in the school. But it's still there, and the police department's still involved in it. We, we go to... Uh, uh, the night that they have the lock-in after the prom, there's probably about eight or nine officers that go. Uh, we're there to, you know, first of all, provide security, and second of all, to be able to, you know, interact with the kids and make sure that they have a safe and fun evening. But again, that was a program and a commitment that the department made to the youth back in the 80s, and we're still, you know, working at that. We're still looking at ways that, that we can build on that. It's a new program that, or something new that, that we're working on for this year before the prom, uh, is taking the junior and senior class kids out, and uh, we have these goggles that you put on, and it is like you're intoxicated. It makes things blurry and gives you this distorted vision, but it's, it's what people who are, are intoxicated, what they're seeing, and the kids are actually going to put those on and, and drive a golf cart through a course of obstacle course of, of cones to see how they react or don't react to something if they've been drinking. And, you know, just looking at how can we keep them safe. We also, when Lieutenant Capella was there, we started looking at, you know, okay, we, we, we've made this commitment to the school, and we're in the schools, you know, this commitment now needs to be taken out into the community. 
And I'm fortunate now that, that uh, the police department, there is a budget, and, and uh, my credit card gets used a lot. Man, I swipe it here, and I swipe it there, and Lieutenant Simpson says, slow down. But I'm always looking for programs. Back when Chief Strope was uh, hired here, he bought with him the Citizens uh, Police Academy. And there's a bunch of graduates in here that have gone through our Citizens Police Academy. And the Citizens Police Academy was started because we wanted the citizens, because ultimately y'all are our bosses, to come in and know and learn about the police department. And so many times you hear people say, well, why did the police do this? Or why didn't the police do this? You're given the opportunity to come in and all the instructors are officers within the department and we go through some of the training that we've gone through to become a police officer and then we also tell you you know why we do the job the way we do it or maybe why something's not done you're you're giving the given the access to the chiefs and to the officers within the department and that's where we still have the ride-along program part of that class is you get to pick which shift day, evening, or night, whatever day of the week, and go ride either the 10-hour shift with the officers or five hours. We always ask that you make the 10-hour commitment, and sometimes it turns into, we've had people that have put in more than 10 hours. Any of you that had rode along in, in this class, did you get stuck for longer than the 10 hours? No? We try. And some, of, no, well, when you come on, you're supposed to get off at 2, and, and you don't get off till 6, that's stuck. <laughs> Trust me. And there are, you know, we've had some riders that, uh, you know, come back with a totally different, you know, perspective, uh, perspective of what the officers do and an understanding of what we do. And the idea behind that was that when we have people that come in and have access to the information, can ask the questions and can learn about it, y'all become ambassadors for the police department. You have an understanding of it, and when somebody starts questioning or wondering, we have people who've been through the academy that know the police department that can say, well, you know, I know a little bit about that, or if you really want to know, go to the police academy. We host the Citizens Police Academy twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. And it's a 10-week course, and uh, we meet on, we met last night, so we meet on Tuesday nights at the police department. And uh, some of the groups we've taken out to the firing range, uh, and then because of their rules, we had to stop. But the class that's going through right now uh, is actually going to get to go through our uh, driving course. And um, it's at low speed, and it's the speed that we go through, but the cones are set to where if your tires just go one direction, the light, at least little bit you hit a cone. So, you know, making the turns, backing up. And each year we're looking at what can we bring new to the, to the academy so citizens have an understanding about it. Well, after having been involved in that for several years, and we, we meet at night, um, I had several people who said they were interested, but going to the academies at nighttime right. are as intense as it was, was hard for them. Right. So I started the Senior Citizens Police and Fire Academy about five or six years ago. Were you in my first class? How long ago was that? Was it 2003? Was it 2003? The fire department has their own academy, and we had ours. So I got with the fire department, and, and I said, well, let's combine our academies, and let's gear it towards senior citizens. So this class is held in the mornings, on Thursday mornings, and we alternate between the police and fire department. And one of the things that I wanted to bring to that academy was not only to introduce you to the police department and to the fire departments, but I also wanted to bring safety information, things that are geared towards the senior citizens. A lot of people say, well, what do you consider a senior citizen? I don't consider any of y'all in here senior citizens. 
it's open to any age group, really, but I call it the Senior Citizens Police and Fire Academy. And we look at the safety information that, that would be beneficial to citizens that are living on their own, that are retired, or maybe life changes have happened that it, it, it's different. So both the police and fire department bring that in. You're able to get on the ladder truck, put on the fire equipment, get in the police cars, you know, get to see everything about it. And our academy starts in April, and I still have openings, and there's applications on the table out front. So if you're interested in it, please pick up an application or get with me and, and talk about it so that we can continue it. Well, I figured we're talking the senior citizens police and fire. We have our regular citizens police academy. <coughs> this year, it will actually be in September, we're starting our first youth citizens police academy. And it's going to be geared towards the high school kids. Again, you know, the younger kids have the robots and the puppets, but I'm looking for ways to reach the high school kids. So we're, having, we're going to host our first youth citizens police academy. And this academy, and, and the citizens police academy and, and, and the senior, there's, it's a lot of lecture. It's not a lot of hands-on. The youth one is going to be very hands-on because I want the kids to be very active. I want them to you know, be involved with the officers. So uh, September, we're going to start our first academy. Also, last summer, it's a project that I had always wanted to take part in, but had never had the opportunity, was I wanted to have a, a summer camp. And um, this camp is, is, is strictly funded through donations in the community. Uh, and we had our first camps last year. We hosted three weeks, and uh, it's half-day camps for fourth and fifth kids that are like in fourth and fifth grade this year, and next year they'll be in the fifth and sixth because that's the the ages that they start seeing officers on campus on a regular basis. So we have the summer camp. Well, from our our commitment from the Dare program. And reaching the older kids, we now have officers. I have two officers that are uh, committed or on a full-time basis to the high school. Their day is entirely at the high school. They actually teach criminal justice courses. And those classes, the kids get credit at Blinn College for a degree in criminal justice. A lot of schools have the school resource officers programs, but in a lot of them, the officers are just on campus to provide security. Our officers are on the campus teaching. Uh, each officer teaches two classes a day, and then they're available for mentoring and helping with security on campus. That was a real success, so we moved it down to the junior high. So I also have two officers, an officer on each one of the junior high campuses, and they also teach the criminal justice courses. Um, we looked at, when Lieutenant Capella came in, he, he wanted to do something more around the police department, so he decided to host a, an Easter egg hunt. Have any of you ever been to our Easter egg hunt? Yeah. yeah. Last year was our 25th year, so this year is 26 years that the department has been hosting an Easter egg hunt, and that's completely funded through outside funds. It does not come out, come out of our budget at the police department. The first couple of years that we hosted the Easter egg hunt, Lieutenant Capella and Cheryl Weikert actually boiled Easter eggs. They said the department reeked of eggs for weeks. It started out on the lawn of the police department, and we had about two, three hundred kids, and we thought, man, this is great. Look at the kids we have out here. And we outgrew the, the front lawn of the police department, so we moved down. The parks department is my partner in everything. I, I couldn't survive without the parks department. They're wonderful. So I went down to Central Park, and we moved the Easter egg hunt, and it grew to where we were eight, nine, you know, thousand kids. We were like, wow, this is great. You know, look at all the kids we have. When the George Bush Library opened, we joined forces with the George Bush Library. You know, that the White House, they have the egg roll, and so they still do the old-fashioned egg roll like they do at the White House. We have games. If you've been out there and you see the games that are out there, those were actually built by a police officer. Like I said, everything we've done is 
done through donations for this. Um, and our Easter egg hunt's coming up on March the 31st, so I'm stuffing candy bags this afternoon. Um, but we have uh, anywhere between 13 to 1,400 kids that attend it now. It's one of the biggest events and programs that the police department's involved in. It's so much fun. It's a lot of, you know, preparing and, and work, but again, it's the commitment. For 26 years, you know, this is something the department uh, has taken on, and it's a commitment that, you know, we're going to keep providing and keep doing in the community. Marcy showed you our trading cards, and that's one of our newest adventures. I have 30 officers that I got a grant for this that have trading cards. And uh, they, the kids and the adults, too, have loved them. And the first person who gets all 30 cards gets a prize if they bring them by the police department to me. But the officers who are not taking part in it you know, are now being bombarded by kids. Do you have the trading cards? Do you have the trading cards? And so, no, but I can direct you to one. And it's the way for the kids and the officers to connect on a positive way. Um, it's very traumatic sometimes with the kids when they get in, uh, parents are involved in an accident or if there, you know, has been a disturbance at their home or something and the police are called. It's always very uh, traumatic to the kids. So the trading cards kind of go along with our Buddy Bear program. And the Buddy Bear program was started 20 years ago. And if you look in the trunk of any of the patrol cars out there today, you'll find a bear. And it's not because all the officers are scared to be out there at night and have to have their bear with them. But the buddy bear is there so that we can give it to children. And having been on patrol and worked accidents where kids are hysterical and crying and mom's being put in an ambulance or something, the bear does really work. I've used them. I've given them out. You know, talk to the, to the children. And we've named the bear together. And, you know, I tell them that the bear is... You know, the bear is my partner, and it does ride with me, and, you know, I feel like you need the bear now more than I do, and I've always called my bear, you know, Charlie, but would you like to name it a, a different name, and will you now take care of Charlie? I need you to really, you know, watch Charlie for me, and, and it takes their mind off of the traumatic event that's happening and gives them something else to focus their attention on. So the, the police department... We're always looking for other ways. We're not just there, you know, to write the citations for speeders. You know, it's not just working the accidents or taking the reports uh, when somebody's become the victim of a crime. We're always looking for ways that, that we can do things in the community. We offer a lot of programs. We have um, a home security survey that we can come out uh, to your home and do an inspection. And if you pass the inspection, you're eligible for a 5% reduction in your homeowner's insurance policy. And what we check are the, the doors, uh, windows, the types of locks that are on your doors and windows, and we make recommendations. We check what this, in this, card has what the state insurance board requires that we check. We've had to go through some training and we're certified by the state insurance board to do the checks. And if we look at this, but we also then step back to the curb and we talk about how you can look at your home, how shrubbery and how lighting can make a difference. There are two of us, myself and Officer Weeza Poppy, who's, who've gone through training. It's called cr Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. And so many times we take something, our landscaping, and because of the way it's used or what we use in a certain location, we're actually making it a hazard for ourselves. So when we come do the surveys, we actually talk about, you know, the shrubbery around the house, what can be done to make your home more secure. Now anything can be defeated. There's nothing on the market that I can sell you, tell you, or show you that's going to guarantee that you're not or won't become the victim of a crime. But so many times if we take a few extra steps, 
we can keep ourselves from becoming the victim of a crime. We make it harder for them. They go on down the road, someplace else. <laughs> How many of you built your homes from the ground up? The ground up. How long did it take you to pick out the bricks on your house? Tan. Tan? Just tan? How about the carpet? How long did it take you to pick out your carpet? A couple of weeks. Marcy, how long did it take you to pick out your carpet? Long time. Long time. And the accent wall in the dining room, you know, the paint? How long did it take you to pick out the locks you put on your door? Did you pick them out? Don't look at me. You can't do it. The contractor put them in. Your contractor. But we can change the locks when we buy a new home. You can. We'd never pick up the phone and call a car dealership and say, bring me a car. I don't care what it is, just bring me a car. But we build a house that holds everything we work 40 to 60 hours a week for, and we let a contractor, who's honest, I'm not saying they're not, but we don't really know them, put the lock on our front door. Don't question it. And that lock is the best defense that you have between you and the criminal element. Just like, the, and I love Volkswagens, just like there's Volkswagens or there's Lincolns, same thing with locks. They can all be defeated, some of them are harder. And that's what we're looking for. It's what can we do to make it harder so they go down the road. And sometimes it's just making sure. I found a lot of the homes that had the glass sliding doors. I don't like glass sliding doors. But I found a lot of homes when I did the inspections that the homes were put in, were put in backwards. The contractor did it. When you, if you have a glass sliding door and you open it, it should slide to the inside of your house and not slide to the outside of your house. There are a lot of ways that you can fix the glass sliding doors. There are, there are a lot of problems. But if you call, we come out. This service does not cost you anything. There are three of us in the department that can come out and do the surveys. It's, it's provided free to the citizens in the community. We do work in College Station. I have gone outside of College Station. If you live outside, you know, um, I make exceptions, but we do primarily work because I have to send in paperwork to the state insurance board on anything that we do. But this is a free service that we provide. One of the other programs that I really like to talk about when I come out here is Operation ID. And this brochure tells you about marking your property and how important it is. And we even provide you in this pamphlet a place to list all your serial numbers because everything has a serial number. What and this... Pen, what pen pen do you use? I'm getting to that. We have engravers. You don't have to go buy an engraver. You can check out an engraver from the police department. If you need assistance marking your stuff, I'll send somebody to help you. But this is important because we have stuff that uh, is recovered and we have no idea who it belongs to, so it goes to auction. I had never pawned anything, and so it was kind of surprising when I found out that pawn shops have to hold items to up to 90 days before they're sold, and we have a volunteer that comes into the police department and gets, we get all the pawn tickets from all the pawn shops here in the county, and that volunteer sets and runs the serial number. And if we get, we call it a hit, and a hit means that we've gotten a deal on the computer that says this item is stolen. Then we contact the agency that it tells us it's stolen from and we start working to recover that property from the pawn shop. And we can return it to an owner. Unfortunately, if I take a report that, you know, you're 27 inch, do they even make TVs that small anymore? <laughs> oh, they're huge. Uh, Zenith color television was stolen. It's not the only one that was made. So that doesn't tell me a lot to be able to recover it. I recovered one TV that was stolen that did not have the serial number. 
And well, I say, mark your property. Well, this TV belonged to a college student. And each day that she came in from class, she chewed bubble gum during her class. <laughs> she put her bubble gum on the TV. And each day she did that until she had a whole roll of bubble gum. And then she'd scrape it off and start over. Well, it left little discoloration marks, little dot-looking things on the top of her TV. And she told me about it, and I went, mm, well, okay. And I happened to be in this apartment several months later, and I looked over at the TV, and I thought, surely there's not two people that really do this. And I got to check in and told the detectives, and they worked on it, and we actually recovered the TV, and that was because it was unusual markings, and, you know, it caught my eye. And, and um, if you ever watch, we have auctions where we have bicycles and we have stuff that's stolen. And, and not only thinking about your stuff in your home, but uh, guys, your lawnmowers and, and your edgers push mowers are stolen regularly and pawns. So, you know, you need to mark all of your property. Sometimes you say, uh, you know, well, I have silver. I have grandma's silver platter and I don't want to engrave it. Uh, we may have guns and we don't want to engrave those. But... Uh, in this pamphlet, it tells you, you know, taking pictures and making sure you've written down any type of, of marks or anything that have, that's happened in jewelry. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. If it has a what? Yes. If if I take a report, then you've been the victim of a crime. Uh, hopefully when you engraved it, you took the time to write down the serial number. But if you didn't, you just have the license, driver's license number, that's enough for us to start working a case and, you know, looking at it. On patrol, if we stop somebody and they had four or five televisions, a computer and stuff, we're going to, you know, start, this is very unusual, especially at 3 o'clock in the morning, and start looking. Uh, we can run that driver's license number. And, you always mark your property with your driver's license number, never your social security number. Right. Your driver's license number, I can take my radio and in less than a, two seconds I can find everything about you from your driver's license number. Mm -hmm. Your social security number uh, should be protected by you like it's gold. You shouldn't use your social security number for anything. Identity theft is very big, but from the driver's license we could track down, call you, get a hold of you was it stolen and stuff, but um, I know I've talked really fast. I have, there's so many things that, that we do at the police department. I love, you know, my job. I look forward to going to work every day. I say I'm one of the, the fortunate few that I have my dream job because I love working with the kids. I love working in the community and in the department.